This is Defending Democracy, a weekly podcast from Democracy Docket. We're your hosts. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. I'm very excited that joining us today on Defending Democracy is Vote.org CEO Andrea Haley. Now, many of you are probably already familiar with Vote.org. It's the nation's largest nonpartisan digital voter engagement organization. During the 2020 general election and the Georgia runoff elections, Vote.org helped more than 4.4 million people register to vote and more than 3.3 million voters request mail-in ballots. It also led a 50-state get-out-the-vote operation, which made over a half a billion voter contacts across the country. Andrea has two decades of experience in voter engagement operations and campaigns and is leading Vote.org in its efforts to expand voting access and update election infrastructure across the country. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mark. I'm so happy to be here. So let me start at the beginning and ask, how did you get involved in this work? feels like I've always been involved in this work. I think I grew up in a family um, where values of, you know, civic participation and, you know, the idea of uh, being an active citizen, an active part of the community around elections um, was just deeply ingrained. We were the, that family that was always giving people rides to the polls, volunteering at the polls. Um, and so I think I grew up with um, people with deep rooted um, stories around civil rights movement. And, you know, being biracial, just the knowledge that um, that my family couldn't always vote. And uh, growing up in Indianapolis, Indiana, I think, you know, I watched as it was, you know, as the voting experiences cut right down the middle line of my family, the experience of my black relatives different than the experience of my white relatives when it uh, came to voting in Indiana, and voter suppression. Um, and it's something I experienced myself. So I think, you know, um, I went to and moved to DC and studied political science and um, really wanted to always work in voting rights and, and civics and wanted to make sure that I was part of the next generation of people protecting access to the ballot box. So before we get to vote.org, um, I have to ask you, as someone who grew up in Indiana, you know, Indiana is a state that kind of confuses me um, because there was a there was a period of time where it seemed, you know, if not a swing state, it had um, it had a strong push and pull in politics. You know, you ha- you saw Democrats and elected uh, Republicans elected. Um, you know, it 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 didn't have the most progressive policies, but it didn't have the most uh, regressive policies. And I'm just curious. Uh, before we get to the work that we're going to talk about today, how do you make sense of what's gone on in the last decade or so in Indiana? That's an excellent question. I think that, um, you know, the Indiana that I grew up in is different than the Indiana uh, right now. I have watched, you know, I, I think that most Hoosiers ha- share um, a sense of community and a sense of values and like aren't really that far apart, but what's happened or they weren't. And I watch as we've had increased polarization in this country, increased radicalization in this country um, that also occur in Indiana. I think we had huge voter turnout in 08 as well in Indiana. Um, And, uh, you know, the backlash to seeing this large voter turnout, much like we've seen in other states, that there's when when record numbers of people show up to participate, like instead of celebrating and finding joy in that and getting really excited and thinking about how we could build systems that include even more people, um, instead there was this pullback and you saw a series of laws um, get passed that, you know, essentially limited people's um, ability to vote. So I think it's not as reflective of the population as it is of the people who um, are currently, you know, leading and who want to control who votes and and who doesn't vote. And it was really, for me personally, in 2020, I um, was head of vote.org and I was living in Indiana. I moved back during uh, COVID and was in, in, you know, went out to vote for early voting and five polling locations were open for over a million people. I had six and seven hour lines myself. 
um, had to go stand in them day after day, try to get my vote in. Um, and you know, it was, it was very wild to see that happen in the state that I grew up in. It's a state that put restrictions on vote by mail. So unless you're 65 and older, you can't vote by mail. So you have to vote in person. Um, and it's interesting because as I go around the country talking to people about voting experiences, I think um, they don't necessarily realize I was just in California, how different the voting experience is in Indiana than, say, California. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that definitely needs to be addressed across our country. But Indiana, um, on the whole, I think it's 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 not, you know, it's not the population that's changed so much. It's the, you know, the polarization, the radicalization and the leadership. Great. So you said in 2020 you were the head of Vote.org. You still are the head of Vote.org. So if someone's listening to this podcast and they want to know what is Vote.org, uh, what do you tell people? Um, Vote.org is an organization that helps to uh, eradicate barriers to voting and helps people access um, the ballot box. So we have our site that you can go to where you can register to vote in every state. You can see the laws and rules in every state. You can request your absentee ballot, find your polling location, basically a one-stop shop for everything you need to, to participate in elections. We also have election reminders people can sign up for so that we send text messages and emails. And we have a get out the vote program um, that focuses on on ramping the next generation into our democracy. Um, and, uh, and in particular, uh, doubles down on working in communities of color and places where we don't see um, large get out the vote budgets always being allocated. And then we have a program that works with companies to give paid time off to vote until uh, the government does what it should do, which is make election day a holiday. For folks who don't know, Vote.org is one of the most important players in making our democracy work um, uh, for all the reasons that you just said. Um, and so you would think, one would think, that states would love Vote.org. I mean, in some respects, you're doing the work of the state and you're not, and you're doing it for free, right? You don't charge the states. You don't, you don't go to Indiana or Texas or we're at Florida and say, hey, we're going to do this, but you, you're going to have to pay us, right? You're doing all of this work for free. What, how do states react to the work of Vote.org? It's a state, you know, it depends on the state. Um, you know, there are some states that are very, you know, welcoming and excited. And then there are other states where we just have, you know, there's continuous, um, continuous tensions. And so it just, it, de it definitely is a state by state experience. And it's no surprise that the states that are the most anti voter are also the states that are difficult at times um, for, for vote.org uh, to navigate or that pass laws that affect vote.org and our and the users that come through, um, you know, the platform and sign up for our alerts and things like that. So I think, um, on the whole, though, there are many states that are pretty excited about the work that we do, we are often the largest uh, registration platform in a, in a given state. Um, and there are a lot of people who welcome that and want to want to see voters be able to participate and have um, a, an easy site clear to read um, that really just articulates how you can participate that is, you know, nonpartisan, We're not telling people how to vote, we're just telling people uh, like that they can vote and where to go. Yeah, and I think that's such an important point that I want to make sure everyone hears this. Vote.org is not partisan. Vote.org, register. you can register as a Republican, you can register as a Democrat, you can register unaffiliated, you can register green, libertarian, whatever the state allows for registration you can do. And so I, I, I find it so deeply offensive that there are states that don't welcome this resource, which is free to them, which is helping their citizens engage in democracy uh, on a nonpartisan basis. I find it deeply offensive, but I'm just curious, um, what do they say to you? Like if a state is hostile, to vote, like what, what is their, like how do they even explain to a vote.org why they wouldn't want you to help them help register their citizens? It's usually a cynical conspiracy theory, if I'm being honest. It's usually something that surprises even me to hear. Um, uh, usually an idea that 
well, you only want to help, you know, certain people somewhere and you're picking and choosing and all of these things, which is, you know, not true. We had in 2020, we had 34 million people come through the platform. We're accessible to anyone that goes to vote.org. Um, we're, you know, pretty excited to do this work and to see high turnout, high participation um, and and not attached to, to what, you know, what that outcome is, what we want to know is that we have a healthy and thriving democracy where every voice, you know, can be heard. And so, you know, usually, usually the, the, the people have a very difficult time articulating a clear, concise and grounded reason why they wouldn't want that work done. And the reason they have a hard time with it is at the end of the day, I think we have two people in this country those who want to see a healthy and thriving democracy and those who want to see a different style of government. And that um, in and of itself is something that people haven't always been willing to just say. But when you don't want to see young people participating, when you don't want to see communities of color participating, when you don't want a platform that just tells people where their polling location is, I mean, it's very obvious that you want eventually some other style of government that doesn't include every voice. And, and that's kind of what it comes down to. And you can go as wild as you want to with um, your statements. But I think when you boil it down, it's really about saying that they deeply believe that there are people in this country that are eligible voters that should not participate. Right. And this is one of the reasons why I am so, um, I am so supportive and so proud of the work that vote.org does. Uh, as a citizen, I'm proud. Um, because we have a we have an under-resourced election system in our country. Like even when you get beyond the question of whether or not I think some states have laws that are aimed at voter suppression, which I do, and all of that, like even on its own merits, like even if taking the laws as they are, we have an under-resourced system. And that has become more and more um, well-known. Election clerks at the local level are overburdened. Um, they are under-resourced, they are under-trained, they are under attack. And here is Vote.org, frankly, carrying the burden of handling one of the most fundamental obligations of government, right? One of the fundamental obligations of government is to conduct free and fair elections and to ensure that voters can participate in them. And here you are Andrew, you're not asking the state to do anything special for you. You're like, we're here to help. <laughs> That's 100 percent right. Um, we're here to serve and serve the voters. We're, uh, you know, a, a nonprofit trying uh, to do our best in this moment in time uh, to to uphold access uh, for voters. And I think that you're absolutely right. We find that a lot of local officials are under resourced um, and especially when it comes um, to having technology they need. Um, uh, so what, you know, what our platform does is really a big service to help serve um, voters in, in those areas. So that means that all the county officials aren't having to independently build something like this on their own. They're not having to independently build tools on their own. Um, and we also, in states that do have um, some routine technical difficulties. The state of Florida would be a great example where every election before the registration deadline, their site goes down. Um, we're able to, you know, keep, we don't, we've had zero downtime, um, as our engineers like to constantly say. And so we are able to, you know, keep the site open and going so Florida voters can still access um, what they need to access. But I think that, that really on the county by county level, election offices across the country are definitely underfunded. It's definitely something that needs to be um, address as a whole. And in the meantime, we are here to serve and to help and to provide this platform and provide the resource that voters need. Yeah. So let me ask you a question about um, uh, technology. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, one of the reasons why you're so effective and so invaluable is because, as you say, there's no downtime, but also the user experience. I mean, I've, I've used vote.org. I've recommended it to other people. The user experience is just very um, sleek. You know, it's very, it's very intuitive. It's very, as you say, the, the laws are there. You know, what is the, I think, I think there's kind of like a lack of understanding why states don't seem to be able to have the kind of customer service oriented web 
portals and sites and forms. Do you have a do you have any insight into that? Is that is that a lack of investment on their part? Is it laws? Is it is it reticence? Like why why is vote.org so much a so much better a user experience? I think it's a little bit of all of the above, um, you know, and it, a complete lack of investment and the tools that we use, um, you know, have have changed over the last generation in our country. And so I think that there's a little bit of catch up in states, um, you know, to play. But I think there's some intentionality to some of this, too. Um, you know, I think that you can go to state sites that sound very, very confusing. Um, and can kind of take the voter into a, a loop where you almost have to be an attorney yourself to figure out how to how to vote. What we do is we take all of that confusing language, we simplify it, and we just say the bare bones of what you need to participate. We make it so that like it's accessible on mobile, um, which in 2023 shouldn't be you know a big a big deal, but is um, in several places, and so that people can do you know conduct business the way they're used to, which is just going on their phones and finding out the information that they um, need. The majority of our users are definitely um, you know using their their mobile phones, and so I think that. Um, I think that there has been a systematic underinvestment in this area. I think some states it's intentional and confu intentionally confusing. Um, I think in other states uh, they just haven't had the resources that they really need to kind of update and and you know pull all this off and provide the digital tools that are necessary um, now. And so anytime you have big shifts in in how um, you know people access information, like we've had huge technological shifts in the last generation, then, then there's a little bit of a lag time, but it really is time for the United States to update its infrastructure and it's time um, for us to resource, you know, election offices the way they need to be resourced. It's also time for states to stop playing around with technical and confusing language. Um, the idea is to build a system where 80% or more of the population can participate and to think about it from that voter's experience, just like you know, you would with anything else. Like you think about it from the, the consumer experience, the voter experience, and then work your way backwards from there. And what we're doing in this country now is, is um, in many states, is not that. In many states, it's about who people want to participate and then building a system that caters to that and not to, um, you know, uh, and I think that the other thing is you have to remember that, you know, who, who wants an online experience? It's like a younger generation. A lot of people who use vote.org are 35 and under. Um, that's a exact population that some states and some people in power don't want to see participating in elections. So I do think that has something to do with it too. Yeah. So that's the question I wanted to ask next. So uh, to the, I assume you you collect some information or you have some sense. Who? What are the demo? What's the like demographics of people who use vote.org? Like where? Like who is your average? I don't know that average is the right term, but like who? Who is your average user? I think about 60% of the people that use vote.org are 35 and under. So, um, and we've seen in the last election cycle, huge spikes in um, women too. So right now, you know, we're, I would say vote.org skews younger and, um, and to a certain extent, right, right this moment, um, higher numbers of women participating um, and coming to the site uh, than men, uh, although it's, it's still pretty close. Um, we don't collect information on like, you know, unless somebody volunteers it on ethnicity and all that, but we definitely, um, we definitely know the age because everybody has to put to register to vote how, you know, old they are. And it's, it's disproportionately a younger generation that's showing up and that we're seeing, you know, huge spikes in participation around younger, younger people on the platform. One of the things we're seeing right now is efforts to make voting harder for young voters. You know, there's just an Idaho law that targets um, college IDs. We saw changes to an Ohio law that also made it harder for young voters. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about Fl what Florida is up to. But, but just in general, um, I think people need to understand what it means when you make it harder for first-time voters or young voters to vote. So can you talk about that and how vote.org is, as I know it is, a critical tool to prevent that sort of cycle of non-voting from beginning? Sure, I mean, I think it starts with, you know, with young people. I remember in my own experience going to college, I had a, um, this is something that has been happening in our country for a long time that we really need to put a stop to, 
which is the disenfranchisement of younger voters. Um, when I went to college, the first year, freshman year, there was a polling location on campus. Um, this is in upstate New York. It was great. I voted. Um, it was easy to access. I knew, you know, the rules and what I needed. The next year, because too many students voted, um, they decided to move the polling location across town. Most people didn't have transportation to get across town. Um, you start introducing, you know, barriers. And all of these little barriers can add up to somebody being disenfranchised from, you know, from the system. So in that case, that was, you know, physical. The people who had cars could go. If you didn't have a car, you couldn't, you know, get out there and, and vote. Um, in this case, is with vote.org, what we see a lot of, um, or we see changes, small changes to rules that can really kind of, um, if you're not, if you're not really focused in on this kind of work, these small rules, you might not understand the full implications of them, or they might not seem like that big of a deal, but all of a sudden it can change, um, the experience. So we see states that haven't passed online voter registration in the year 2023. It's kind of crazy that there, you know, that there are any states that don't have online voter registration. Most people are used to, you know, voting online. You see requirements to like print forms out and sign them physically with pen and ink. You sign, you have, when you do that, you now have to have a printer. 50% forget super young people, millennials, take millennials. 50% of millennials don't own printers. So now you've just kind of taken a whole, you know, generation um, and, and put, cut it in half. And then once you have that, you need pen, paper, envelopes, stamps. No one in the younger generations of our country is used to um, sending, you know, sending in letters or, or anything like that. So it just kind of adds to the number of steps you need to take. And everyone knows that as you add to the number of steps you need to take, people wash out of the process. And wow. that is the point of many of these laws. Um, it's not really about uh, how to make the election system better. It's about how many people, young people, you can kind of wash out of participation. Yeah. And the point you make about postage is so important. This is a point I make over and over again. You know, I um, argue, I've argued now for years and I've litigated over the question of free postage for voter registration materials, for ballots, uh, ballot applications. And it's interesting because the reaction I usually get is, oh, is that because of it's a poll tax? You know, it's a tax on wealth. It's a basically a dis distinguishes wealthier from less wealthy voters. And I always say, like, yeah, it has that component. But honestly, the biggest impact of postage is age based. You know, imagine someone in your life who is in their 70s and then imagine someone in your life who's in their 20s. And ask of them, ask you which one of them has a roll of postage stamps in their drawer. And that's really irrespective of income, right? I mean, that's like, that's not so much an income level thing as it is an age thing. And so I, I really think that this whole thing about like having to print stuff out, put it in envelopes, put stamps on it, really has no explanation other than a disincentive based on age, because it, it correlates more strongly with age than it does anything else, including race, including gender, anything else. It's really, uh, really a barrier for, for age. I went to a school and was giving a talk about civic participation. And, um, and the number one question I was asked, I thought it was going to be asked all these different questions about, um, you know, just overall processes and politics. And um, the number one question I was asked was, where do you get, where do you even pick up postage? So, <laughs> you know, that I think your point is a really good one. And it's definitely true. And it's definitely well known. You think about, you, you think about the average younger person and they literally do everything online. There isn't something that they can't do online that they have to take care of. And you can pay your bills online. You can check your bank account online. You can check your, if you're a student, you can check your student courses and grades online. You can turn things in online. We just had a whole year during COVID where all young people across the country were, were uh, like doing everything they need to do online. And so I, I think that there, there's definitely not um, familiarity with, with having to go through these extra steps. And, and there's not actually a good reason for them to have to. I think that's the other part of it here is just that like, there's, there, it is the year 2023. 
there, we have the technology, we have, you know, everything we need to set this up well to on ramp the next generation into our democracy. We just need to have the political will to do so. Um, that's there. It would be different if there were real barriers and we we're having to build super, you know, complicated things as a nation for young people to be able to have this experience without postage stamps. But it's just not true. It's it's accessible um, and ready and ready to go right now. Right. So one of the other barriers you mentioned, I would argue, is the states have to go out of their way to disenfranchise voters. Like it's not just that we're not building. It's actually you have to go out of your way. And that is the wet ink or original signature. And in full disclosure, my law firm is representing Vote.org in litigation involving that that I'll let you talk about. Um, but, you know, just to level set here. States have been passing laws, as they should, over the course of the last decade, and it really ramped up with COVID, to increase the legal use of digital signatures or facsimile signatures or scan signatures. And what's unbelievably maddening is that you have states that are modernizing their codes to say you can use these digital signatures for everything. You can use it for real estate transactions. You can use it for binding contracts. You can use it to open bank accounts. Like literally the most sensitive things in society, states are changing their laws to allow. And that's good for them, by the way. Like I'm all for it, all good. And yet, Andrea, talk about what they're doing when it comes to voting and signatures. When it comes to voting and signatures, they are actually, um, you know, becoming regressive. They're going backwards in time and they're saying, OK, actually, it needs to be a quote unquote wet signature, meaning that it has to be signed with a pen. It can't be your digital signature. It can't be a photo of your signature that you upload. It can't be, you know, and it, it it's hilarious in a lot of ways if it, if it wasn't so serious. Um, because, you know, how many times a day do business people across this country use DocuSign or HelloSign or um, like you, the point you just made, which is real estate transactions and, you know, our, our economy is basically at this point set up um, to use digital signatures. And I feel like this question of whether a digital signature constitutes an actual signature has been answered so many times. And now states are going backwards and saying, hey, for your it's fine for everything else, for your hunting license, your driver's license, uh, but for your voter registration form, we all of a sudden need a wet signature, which you know takes extra steps. And so I think it kind of makes it obvious that the only reason that they're doing that is to, you know, to try to dis disincentivize some people from from the system by creating an extra hoop for them to jump through. And you're challenging, and you're challenging this in court. Oh yeah, we're challenging this in court in um, you know Florida, Georgia, Texas. Um, recently won a case in Texas and in federal court, and now uh, arguments have been heard on the appeal. Um, but I think, you know, what is interesting, well, what was also interesting in Texas is that then how do you take all these wet signatures and get them uh, to the Secretary of State, scan them in, and then... That's the thing is they don't even use the wet signature. Yeah. They then digitize, they then digitally scan the signatures. Yes. Um, so that is, you know, kind of, feels like you're kind of going in circles here with some of these some of these arguments because again it boils down to what we were talking about before which is some people want to see a healthy and thriving democracy and some do not and that's why people have a hard time making like really great logical arguments against like why we shouldn't why we should be shouldn't be able to use you know electronic signatures or digital signatures so um but yes we're challenging these in court i think uh, you know taking legal action has to become an integral part of voting rights strategy. We've been doing so much get out the vote work, um, but you can only do so much when you have bad policies that are passed that then make the work more expensive, tougher for programs to get voters across the finish line and get them to the ballot box. Um, uh, you talk about it's basically more man hours and more and, and a higher you know expense. And so to the degree that our users and get targeted, we have to then fight back. I do believe that when it comes to you know uh, voter suppression laws, that you have like that you have to meet bullies kind of where they are. You have to have some 
pushback or it just goes further and further and further. And I think that, um, you know, I think it, it becomes really important for us at vote.org to protect the experience of voters and to make sure that they have everything they need to be able to, you know, participate in elections. And we see the integration of legal strategy as, as part of that. I think, um, you know, after 2020 election, again, we should have all been celebrating that there was such high voter turnout across the country. Instead, we saw a ton of voter suppression bills uh, crisscross the United States. And now we're having to, you know, challenge some of that legislation to make sure that in future elections, as many people can participate as possible. When you talk to groups of young voters, which I assume you do fairly often, um, how do they process these voter suppression laws aimed at them and the litigation that follows? Like, are they perplexed by it? Are they energized by it? Are they, I mean, it always struck me that one of the values of when vote.org goes to court is obviously you wanna make policy better. You want to you want to improve it. You want to roll back the restrictions. You want to win, essentially, the case. But this, this the second is, as you say, you want to show the bullies that they can't get away with it. That 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 that. It, but the third, and this is the one I'm curious about, is you want to show the voters that you're fighting for them. You know, one of the things that I always think is so terrible are long lines. You know, you mentioned long lines, and like I always say to to. To you were talking about your experience in Indiana, and I always say to politicians, like, people don't want to wait in line. Like, they want to see that you are fighting for them not to wait in line. You know, like, it's, like, it's not, it, 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 people want to know that you, someone is standing in their corner fighting against these inconveniences, these burdens, these long lines, these signature, wet signature laws, because they, they, they are, they are, they are otherwise feel like they are just being victimized and no one's in their corner. And I'm just curious how young voters you think process those different, those different lines of argument. I think there's been a, like a big awakening. Um, when I first started, there was sort of a lack of information. I would go and I would talk to, you know, groups of young voters, younger people, and there was a question, you know, of like, what's really happening? There was a like, a, there was some distance between full engagement and awareness. When I talk to young voters now, that distance is very small. People are aware that they're being targeted. Um, they're they are aware that there's a system that is not always built for their full inclusion. Um, they're mad about it, they're active, and they have connected the dots between the things that they really care about in their like neighborhood or community or city or state, and the fact that like having a voice that to help you know elect ele have a say in who's elected that that matters that those decisions um, matter and will affect their lives and the lives of people that they care about, and so it's been really great to see this you know, big awakening that's happened, you know, across the country. And I think that that's why we're seeing huge spikes of, um, you know, youth participation and of um, young people participating with the vote.org platform. I think it makes um, people angry. I think there's a backlash to these laws. Um, uh, I think there's a back, anytime you roll back rights, um, no matter who it is in our country, like Americans don't like having rights taken away, having something and then having it taken um, back. I do think that some of the legislation in Georgia also really, you know, I've heard people quote that all across the nation, the banning of food and water at polling locations with long lines. Like, I think that struck a note with people because they could really see, okay, this isn't just like a wonky law that I don't understand. This is literally like somebody wants me in a long line, which as you say, Mark, and I, I now echo all the time, is like a policy choice, right? And now they don't even want me to have like water while I stand in that line. The lack of like humanity in that, I think struck people. And everywhere I go, I hear that example given. I do think young voters, um, I think the reaction is that they're wanting to like learn more, learn more about how to participate because it's become obvious that somebody doesn't want them to. Um, they are like becoming the vote captains of their own lives and getting their friends and family to participate. I see a huge increase in social media posts about voting and democracy. Um, I think I think over the last couple of years, there's been a really, really big awakening. And I think that like local elections, there's been a big awakening. You know, mayor's races recently, we saw a lot of people reaching out to vote.org around their local mayor's race. I think they under, pe young people understand that 
you know, where are budgets allocated? That matters. Who's collecting like the trash? It matters. Where are police budgets being allocated? That matters to people. So I think that young young people are really kind of stepping up. I think they're angry. I think they're angry and they know they're being targeted. I want to talk a little bit about how some of these laws are targeting them, how some of these laws are targeting, frankly, you. Uh, <laughs> but before I do, you mentioned that one of the programs you run um, is trying to convince or support or what have you, corporate America being more pro-voter. And full disclosure, I have been very um, anti-corporatist about this. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm not a supporter of the free market system, but I feel like corporate America put out a lot of, of great statements after Georgia's SB202 and after what we saw in Florida and Texas, and then frankly walked away from the issue largely. So I come at this as a skeptic of corporate America's uh, commitment to voting. So tell me tell me good news or convince me why I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I'm a relentless optimist, so I will, I will do my best here. I think you know, we did have a thousand companies that joined us in giving paid time off to vote. Um, that affected about 1.8 million workers across the United States. So we're really excited about that and looking to build on it. I think that, um, you know, it's a good initial first step because somebody in leadership can say, hey, we're giving the day off or go take any time you need today to vote, come back, especially when we're talking about states with long lines and things like that. Like that becomes really um, that freedom becomes important. It's always, uh, you know, voters always say that not having the time to vote is one of the things that keeps them from participating. So corporate partnership on that is really important. We did see some companies um, also step up and do work around get out the vote efforts. And we're, we know that companies and schools are two of the still trusted places for voting information. So just like, how do you get to your polling location? How do you get your absentee ballot? People will still accept that information from their employer. So we really try to work closely with companies to encourage them around election time to give that information out, to hold talks or lunches, to you know um, move things forward. I'm with you on corporate America should and needs to do a lot more. They don't always realize the responsibility they have. They're part of the backbone of our democracy. And the moment is an urgent one um, in our country. And I think I think they're not always used to the idea that they would have to defend democracy. But if, if you look through history, um, whether it's recent history uh, in like say Hungary or it's, uh, you know, a, few generations ago around World War II, whenever you see rolling authoritarianism or fascism, companies always um, have a role to play. And them not stepping up in urgent moments can be catastrophic. And so they need, they do need to do more and lean, um, lean harder into uh, protecting elections and, and to holding politicians accountable who um, are part of the category of people who want to see a different style of government. It's no secret that like businesses don't do well um, in that in a different style of government. They do much better democracies, um, and it's in the U.S. Democracy has been quite good to a, a number of businesses. So yes, we want to see them do more and push them to do more. And in the meantime, we have tiered strategies of okay. We know that not everyone is going to be the most proactive right off the bat, but how do we on ramp companies into participation? What can we get them to take the first step of giving paid time off to work? Um, to vote, or can we give them get them to do the next step of then, you know, helping their um, employees with everything they need to participate in an election, and then ultimately, can we get them to really work with state legislatures to make sure that there's some accountability and pushback when it comes to alienating? And this is the thing: alienating their own employees' ability to participate. I mean. Um, if, if you're alienating their employees and you're alienating their customers, that can't be good for business either. So um, they're going to have to stop thinking so short term and look at the long term implications of, of what this means for their business. And they're going to have to take on the responsibility and realize it is theirs to carry. We all have a role to play and companies certainly have a big one to play in pushing back. My uh, ask of corporate America, my challenge to corporate America today uh, is I understand you're not going to go as far as I think you should and as far as 
frankly, many of companies were willing to do in the 70s and 80s around uh, engagement. Forget about, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, they were willing to go further. But why doesn't every public company, ever, or at least every Fortune 500 company, put on your public-facing website a link to vote.org? That is nonpartisan. It would be a, a service to democracy. It would be a service, frankly, to your customers, to your consumers, to people who are visiting your website. It would be a powerful statement about where you stand on the most fundamental part of democracy, which is making sure everyone's registered. And, you know, if you're not willing to do that, then I'm not sure what the hell you are willing to do. So that's that's going to be my ask. But I want to I want to make sure we have time to talk about what the hell the legislatures around the country are up to. And I am particularly focused, uh, as anyone who follows me on Twitter knows, I am particularly focused on following the happenings, <laughs> the, the never good happenings uh, in Florida. Florida uh, has uh, two strikes against it. Uh, the first is, as you pointed out, they literally have their voter registration <laughs> system crash predictably every two years before the deadline for voter registration. I don't know why, but it happens. I've gone to court over it. Others have gone to court over it. Sometimes it occasions a natural disaster. Sometimes it doesn't. It just it just kind of like seems to be a problem. But the second is Florida is now engaged in uh, legislation that has made voting harder. That's no secret, SB 90 and other laws. But right now, I am obsessed with a bill in the Florida legislature, SB 750, which is aimed, in my view, squarely at the work you do and organizations like you do. So can you talk about what Florida SB 750 is and how it relates to vote.org? Yes. Um it's a pretty large scale bill that has a lot going on in it. Um, everything from, you know, election security forces to a prefill um, uh, of applications, uh, which is, I think, the big the part that really is affecting vote.org the most. Also, trying to make third party of registration uh, voter registration groups re register every year um, with the state. Uh, making first-time voters, uh, and we still are looking for what the final language will be around all this, but making first-time voters vote in person. Um, there, There's a lot happening in the bill that they're trying to accomplish that would kind of roll back voting rights in the state of Florida. For us, when you come to vote.org and you're a Florida resident, you go to vote.org to register to vote, you're putting in all of your information. Um, you put in all of your voting information, and right now we create um, because of their wet signature law right now, we create a PDF that you can then print out with all of your information in it and send in. It just cuts down one of the steps so that you're not uh, taking a form and then having to hand fill out the entire form. You could just do it right there on your phone or on your computer, print it out yourself, have the PDF in your inbox. What this bill would do is it would ban our ability to to pre-fill that information out. So again, this is sort of death by a thousand paper cuts kind of situation. Um, anyone who isn't registered with the, the Department of Motor Vehicles in Florida, which is about 2 million people, um, would then have to, you know, print out their form and then hand fill all of it out. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on a second. The, the paper that they're printing out currently they're giving you the information, right? You're not you're not like making it up or guessing it or using artificial intelligence <laughs> to pull from some other database, right? No, this is people organically coming to the site, putting in their information, and then us using putting affixing all that information to the form and resending it to them. And, and they want, and Florida wants you not to be able to do that. That's right. Why on earth? I mean, I assume, by the way, one of the benefits of doing it your way is that the form, that part of the information is legible, right? Because oh, like, yes. it's not handwritten. This should make it much easier for local officials. Um, it highly legible, um, all filled out, you know, by the voter. It's, you know, it, 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 This makes a clean experience for the voter as well. Um, so this is, should be a win-win for everyone all the way around. The only reason 
to put a law like this in place that I could possibly think of is that it takes one step out of the process for voters and makes it slightly easier for voters. And again, I think it boils down to that, like, do you want voters to participate in elections or not? Okay. Mm -hmm. This seems nuts. I mean, like, honestly, from just the outside listening to this, this seems absolutely insane. You are filling a gap in Florida that Florida desperately needs you to get fill. Okay. Like you are doing something for the state of Florida for free that the state of Florida does not have the ability to do. And on top of that, you're spending money and resources and technology to make sure that their forms are filled out properly, that the voters are filling out the portions that they have to fill out, that they're being filled out legibly and completely. And Florida is trying to stop that. That's correct. Is that what you're saying? Florida leaders are trying to stop that. And I think what people have gotten away from is the idea of like every person in office is there because they're supposed to be doing the job of public service, supposed to be serving the public. If you're serving the public, you would want something like our tools at vote.org. Um, you'd be excited about them. I think when you get away from the idea of like you're there for public service, then maybe it becomes easier to put stuff in bills like this, you know, that say, uh, that cut down on the voter experience for, for individuals. I'm just highly disappointed to see this language in the bill where, you know, we're going to fight it. Um, I think that, that at the end of the day, if everyone were to center the experience of the voter and really only think about the people that they're serving, um, the impact on the people that you're serving, um, uh, and, and, and do what we do at vote.org, which is say, what is the voter experience and how do we make this the, accessible for everyone? How do we get as many people as possible, as many eligible voters as possible through the process? If you're really thinking that way, um, uh, regardless of party, but just centering, centering people, um, then, then you would build a system that looks a lot different. And until people start doing that, we'll be there to continue to fight. And luckily, um, we'll be there alongside your team uh, fighting all the way and fighting a lot of the, the, these voter suppression tactics. But it is crazy and it is really sad. It's a sad state of affairs. Well, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing for democracy. Thank you for everything you're doing for states that seem to want to make it harder for you. And I know this fight will continue um, in public. This fight will continue in court. And uh, we, we will all work together to make sure that democracy is protected and you will be a huge uh, part of it as you've already been. So thank you, Andrea Haley, for joining us. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to your amazing team um, at Democracy Docket. We're so happy to be um, in this fight with you. Thank you. You can find all of the cases, court filings, and articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave us a review. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and make sure to subscribe to our free daily and weekly newsletters. Also, visit the Democracy Docket merch shop at store.democracydocket.com. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Paige Moskowitz, Alexa Rothenberg, and Sophie Feldman. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.